It sounds pretty terrible, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 Let's not mince words. Division, swords, blazing fire, stress. Especially after last week, after have no fear, little flock, it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. We would expect to hear something a little more happy than I have come to bring division. If we're being perfectly honest, I wonder if what Jesus describes today maybe sounds more to your ears like God's absence than God's presence. Yeah? Maybe this sounds a little bit more like a world cursed by God rather than one blessed by God. And yet, Jesus says this is his baptism, his vocation, the job given him to do by God, to enkindle this fire and to watch it burn. What could God possibly be up to here? I had to look, I had to take the long view for this one, folks. Way back at the beginning of chapter 11, Jesus casts out a demon. Now that seems like a pretty Jesus-y thing to do, right? I mean, he's the son of God after all. Demons are kind of his natural enemy. The thing is, the people in the story don't see it that way. Some of them accuse him of being demonic himself. Say that he's casting out demons by the power of Beelzebul, the prince of demons. In other words, they look at Jesus doing his most Jesus-y thing imaginable, and they still don't see God at work. Now that story should make us stop and think. The people in the story are Jews. They are God's chosen people. These people know God better than anybody. In that story, between there and here, there are Pharisees. Pharisees are the most religiously pious people there are. They're devout in their religion, and they're strict in their adherence to the law. In other words, these are all the folks who should know God better than anyone, who should be able to recognize God, and yet they can't. Here is God's Son right in their midst, doing God's work, and they can't see it. It's enough to make you wonder. If they can't recognize God's Son in their midst, would we do any better? Like the rich fool from the parable a few weeks ago, we often tend to confuse God with other things. Things like wealth, or comfort, or privilege, or power, or peace, or success. Sometimes in our attempt to find God in those things, we end up worshiping the things themselves as idols instead, losing sight of God entirely. It is God's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. But this story makes me wonder, will we know that kingdom when we see it? It's our confusion on that front that makes our world deeply broken. Our world is full of hatred and oppression, exploitation and abuse, all because we end up worshiping things other than God, devoting ourselves to those things, chasing after those things, and protecting ourselves from those who would take them from us. Jesus comes to exercise those idols from us and to turn us once again to God. But as you might imagine, that's no small job, is it? How easily do we human beings part with wealth, with power, with privilege? How easily have you yourself let go of those things in the past? Is it any wonder that the job Jesus comes to do brings conflict and division? Now, division and conflict may not seem like godly things, but then neither does death, right? And yet each week we pray, here by your wisdom are both life and death, growth and decay. God's good world is characterized by both. Death without life leaves the universe barren and cold, but life without death is static and unchanging. It's the tension between the two in which renewal happens. And so I hear Jesus encouraging his hearers to interpret this tension as a prelude to what is coming. To him, it's as obvious as the weather. Everybody is an expert on the weather, right? Every armchair meteorologist that can tell you that a dry summer leads to a particularly nasty fire season, 
or that when the Pineapple Express blows through, there's going to be a ton of wind and rain. And yet, he observes, we can tell what's happening in the sky, but we look at division and conflict, and we say that these things are demonic rather than godly. We say that God is absent from them rather than present in them. And his response is, you hypocrites. You're as bad as the Pharisees who think they're being religious and pious and are actually more concerned with hand-washing than compassion. In short, what Jesus is saying here is that there can be no resurrection without death. There can be no growth without decay. There can be no construction without demolition. The city that God has prepared for us, that heavenly homeland for which we are waiting in faith, that city is coming, but first the ground has to be leveled and cleared. We know this. As the old saying goes, if you're going to make an omelet, you have to break a few eggs, right? And we disciples of Jesus have taken that order to heart over the last few centuries, breaking eggs and swinging swords and kindling fires and civilizing the heathens to make way for God's kingdom. But is it God's kingdom? Or is it someone else's that we're building? Can we reliably tell the difference between God and Beelzebul? The story suggests we may not. We can tell when it's about to rain, but can we tell where God is at work? As I look at human history, it seems to me that we tend to do the most harm when we try to do the most good. When we become more focused on the outcome than on the process, things fall apart. And by that I mean when we try to skip to the end result without putting in the blood and the sweat and the tears that it takes to get there. Because our shortcuts tend to involve those things that we like to worship, things like power and coercion. If we want the perfect society, the easiest way to achieve it is simply to exclude or kill anyone who isn't perfect. But if I'm remembering my Bible stories correctly, that didn't even work out for God during the flood. So why should we think it would work any better for us? We want peace and justice, so we kill those who are unjust. We want morality, so we legislate it, so that we can enforce it on others. We want consensus, and so we vote and we expect the minority to fall in line. We want security and safety, and so we store up wealth and resources. And what happens? We worry ourselves to death over how to protect those things and keep them safe and secure. When we follow the way of the world, the way of power and wealth and privilege, we end up with none of what we want. And so Jesus offers another way. It's a less efficient way, a way that is messy and unreliable and frankly relies far too much on the ability of other people to learn and grow for themselves. And unlike our ways, Jesus' way doesn't shrink from conflict or confusion. We are busy trying to end those things, but the way of Jesus invites those things and lives with those things and owns those things. The way of Jesus pays the price of blood and sweat and tears to slowly work toward that end that only God can bring. When the preacher of Hebrews says to run with perseverance the race, they're not talking about a sprint. But they're not talking about a marathon either. They're talking about a relay. History is littered with the stories of people who ran their leg and never saw the end of the race. And yet they ran. They ran, and because they ran, we look up to them. We call them saints and heroes. But they didn't run for our admiration. They didn't run so that we would commend them. They ran because they believed, not in the finish line, but in the race and what it meant. I'm always struck by that line. Yet all these, 
though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God has provided something better. Something better that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. What I hear in that line is that there is no reward for faithfulness. There is no reward for faithfulness. Just as no one gets a medal for completing a single leg of a relay, in this race, we all win together or we all lose together. But whatever happens, it ain't going to happen until the last runner has crossed the line. There is no reward for faithfulness. There is only the hope of what waits at the finish line. I wonder if we understand what that means. Sometimes I think we get so impatient with God that we try to build God's kingdom ourselves to force the world around us into submission to God's will. But whenever we do, it always ends up being someone else's kingdom. We always end up submitting ourselves to someone else's will. Maybe circumventing the process, the way, is circumventing God. Maybe it's like going to the store and buying the medal instead of winning the race. It doesn't mean anything. It makes me wonder if God's greatest hope for us is not to give us the kingdom, but to form us into the kingdom. All those people the preacher talks about, the ones who lived by faith, who never received God's promise, that, that great cloud of witnesses that surrounds us, those people endured the division and the conflict and the stress of living as citizens of a city that hadn't yet been built because they believed in the process. They believed in the race. And that's why we remember them. Some of them get, did great deeds of renown on their own, like Gideon or Barak or Samson or Jephthah or Gandhi or King or Colby or Monk. But there are scores of others whose names are not remembered. They too endured mocking and flogging and chains and imprisonment and worse because they believed in God's way, even when that way led them to stoning and sawing and stabbing. In spite of everything those folks did, both the ones we remember and the ones we've never heard of, God's kingdom is not yet here. We have not yet received that promise. Does that mean that they were wrong? That they died in vain? Or does it mean that we have something to learn about faith, even from those nameless, forgotten martyrs who lived for something more than the eye can see? Rather than putting our faith in and chasing after the things that we can see, things like power or wealth or peace, we are asked to look to Jesus, to the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Jesus, who allowed himself to be broken in the faith that something better, something unseen was at hand. Each week, we break this bread and remember that with Jesus, we too are broken for the life of the world. Divided and scattered in faith, so that just as the grains of wheat, once scattered on the hill, are gathered into one to become one bread, one loaf, we also will be gathered again into one and made perfect, made whole, together. It's not a process that can be rushed or shortcut. In fact, I think it's not a process that we can accomplish or achieve at all, any more than one runner can win a relay race. We are invited to behold the brokenness around us, the brokenness of our world and of our communities and congregations and even of ourselves, to behold those things like a cloud in the West. 
the cloud tells us to expect rain. Can our brokenness teach us to expect God's wholeness? Can that brokenness, can that conflict and division and stress and fire help us to trust in what God is doing?